the meeting is live now please start the meeting good evening all I welcome you all to the 16th edition of ksys ophthalmology pg classroom we have we are privileged to have with us today dr vanathi murugeshan who is professor of cornea at rp center uh, after her mbbs at uh, madras medical college she came into you know the rp center for her md and then the senior residency and I had a short stint back in her hometown before she came back to rp center and joined there and currently she is uh, heading the corneal and ocular surface clinic and cataract and refractive surgery she has more than 100 publications and she is a avid teacher and that does not require any further this thing because she has taught me a lot of clinical skills as a senior uh, to me. So uh, welcome you, ma'am. Yeah. And uh, today what we will do is we'll go through some corneal spotters. And we will also be joined by Dr. Anil Radhakrishnan, our corneal colleague from Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. So both of them will take you through this corneal uh, cases. We have about 10 cases today. We will initially you know, put the case up and have a description of that case by one of the postgraduates, followed by you know, getting into a differential diagnosis mode. And then, uh, you know, you know, pointing towards a diagnosis and then move into discussing the case. Probably seven minutes uh, per case can give us somewhere around 75 minutes for 10 cases. Now, without wasting any further time, let us start the case. Mira, can you start presenting? And also, can you start, uh, you know, describing the first case? Okay, sir. So uh, this is the anterior segment picture of the right eye uh, with uh, diffuse conjunctival congestion as well as circumciliary congestion. And there is a irregular, irregular shaped uh, center involving epithelial defect um, with uh, maybe yellowish shield filtrate. And the, the um, can you see my cursor? Yes, we can see it, Mira. Okay, okay. So, so we can see an epithelial defect here of size about five into four mm, and there is scarring in the temporal region of the ulcer, and also a dirty, uh, dirty black to greenish pigmentation in the center, and also there are. Uh, multiple yellowish infiltrations or uh, branching pattern like lesions in the nasal part. Also, there is a convex shaped hypopion in the anterior chamber. So, it is most uh, it's suggestive of a fungal corneal ulcer, mostly dermatitious fungus. Uh, Mira, you are a first year student? No, ma'am. Second. Uh, second, year. second year. Yeah. Okay, you're finishing your second year? Yeah, ma'am. Okay, great. I, I, I think uh, you did catch on uh, most of the clinical points here. And uh, so when you start describing an ulcer, describing a particular picture, then you would say this is the uh, a clinical photograph, a color clinical photograph of the so we right. can make out the right eye or the left eye here. So showing the the cornea uh, and the uh, and uh, the adjoining conjunctiva, as you rightly said, there is seems to be diffuse conjunctival okay. all around here. So we are not really able to say that it's diffuse, but definitely there is a, a circumciliary and you have a, a lesion involving the the central, central. Cornea, the, about the central it's five it's millimeters of the cornea, and this you can see is a an inflamed eye here, an inflamed ocular surface you're saying. So it is an active lesion. So it is a, a keratitis which you are seeing. Again, yes. you're not able to make out an ulcer because there is no fluorescein staining on this and you do not have a, a, a slit which is put on here which should be able to delineate the epithelial okay. ulceration. Though you could sort of vaguely make out but you cannot really tell for sure. So what okay. you're seeing is a a stromal infiltrate 
which is involving the central cornea and in the, the superior part, so in the part from about the one o'clock to the to the five, four, five o'clock position, there is a mild, you know, sort of uh, a satellite lesions mm -hmm. over here, a very, a very um, uh, coarse dendritic kind of stromal infiltrates. They mm -hmm. all seem mm -hmm. to be deep stromal and mm -hmm. not involving just the epithelium. Mm -hmm. In this region, it is definitely stromal here. And uh, probably there's an epithelial ulceration in this region, but we cannot really comment unless we've done a fluorescein staining or we have a slit to delineate. This seems to be a fixed hypopion here. Yes. So, there, it's, so it's a hypopion corneal ulcer, which you're seeing. And this central reason which you're seeing over here, which you probably thought was a epithelial defect here or the ulcer, this is a pigmented fungus which is growing on the superficial cornea. Okay. So this is why you, you rightly did say it's a dermataceous fungi, but when you describe, it's all there in the description for you here. So when you find this uh, faint grayish brownish growth on the superficial surface of the cornea, that is a definite clinching point to show that this is a mycotic ulcer. So let me just ask you when you examine this patient, what features other than what you have described will be, you know, really points to say that this is a fungal ulcer when you're doing a smith lamp evaluation? What would be staring at you to say that this is a fungal ulcer? Anything? Anybody can join in. Anybody can, uh, can answer this. I think uh, some of my PGs are there is a very common question which I always ask them in the clinical rounds. There is a feathery margins we can be seen, and also elevated edges are can be seen and uh, dry texture. Ulcer. Yes, a dry yeah. looking ulcer with the yes. feathery yeah. margins, right? Then and, and, uh, the dirty white or grayish um, uh, appearance, and also sometimes there's colon button configuration, and also a, some a fixed hypopion. Okay, so you have a fixed hypopion. Something which will be staring at you is you you find a significantly uh -huh. large ulcer which is sitting there. But when you examine a mycotic ulcer, the patient would be largely comfortable. So that would be one of the very important clinical signs which tells you that this is a fungal ulcer which you're examining. So usually you would have the, the signs more than the symptoms, which would be really, you'll, you'll really be able to pick this up here. Of course, here you have a fungal ulcer staring at you. You have dermatitious fungi, which is growing on the surface of the cornea. So that's telling you that this is a fungal corneal ulcer which you're seeing. But your signs will, will overdo your symptoms. You will find a large ulcer and you put the patient on the slit lamp. He would be comfortable and would be looking at you without, you know, without much photophobia or without much discomfort. Reservoirs, if this was a bacterial ulcer, you would find a significant amount of lid edema, a significant amount of blepharospasm. The patient will have a lot of weathering, a lot of symptoms, even for a smaller ulcer. So that would be a differentiation in an active ulceration caused by a bacteria and caused by a fungus here. So I think the rest of the clinical features we have largely described. So for you as postgraduates, you would probably want to look at just because we just have about seven minutes for each. I think I'll just sort of trigger points which you have to go back and read is the the various mycotic organisms, which are cornea pathogenic. So it's, it's all what you studied in your microbiology. So look at the classification of the fungi, which can affect the cornea. So look at the, uh, look at what are the common names here and what are the common ones, which are, which affect the cornea uh, in, in terms of the geographical variation. So that's something which you will have to know. There is a definite geographical variation among mycotic keratitis in North India versus South India. I can see Dr. Anil here. Hi, Dr. An Anil. Nice Hi, Anil. Yeah, sorry that I got a bit I stuck welcome up. you to cut in my monologue and do carry <laughs> on from here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, no, I just wanted to ask, uh, Vanity, like when you said that there would be this fixed hype up on seeing this, it's because it's a convex upwards? Was it because of that? Because how could you say it's fixed hype up here? Yeah, would anybody like to answer uh, Dr. Gopal's question? Any of the PGs? Looking like a cheesy thick. Uh, 
is usually like only while we are shifting the patient then only we can find out whether it is a shift yes. So okay. here it's quite a thick coagulated hypopion appearance which you are having here and a head tilt will help you to show that this is having a, a shifting position here out here. So you would be able to see whether it's shifting or not here and then when it becomes thick and coagulated it starts becoming a more of a, a fixed hypopion and you would not be having a fixating position here. Uh, yes Anil you would like to take it on over the geographical variations? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, we have, um, like we have mentioned multiple times in the our classrooms that uh, there is definitely a variation between the North Indian. Uh, I think even last week we had a discussion regarding that. Uh, uh, the aspergillus is obviously much more common and that's why the studies show that the Boriconosol has got a much better effect in uh, the studies from North India, especially RP Center. Uh, but the same story is not exactly repeated in uh, Arvind Madurai or in Alvi Prasad Hyderabad uh, because most likely because of the geographical variation. Fusarium is the dominant species in Arvind Thai care system and that too Solani which is not really sensitive to Boriconazole. So in, uh, if you have Aspergillus, it's probably slightly more advantageous in that we have two drugs and one boriconazole which has got a better penetration into the cornea and into the anterior chamber. But uh, with natamycin, as you know, the penetration is very less. And so uh, we are limited in our uh, armentarium regarding the treatment. Yes. Uh, so as Anil rightly pointed out here that... Uh, what you would like to do beyond this? Yes, yes, Mira, would you like to see once this is there in your OPD, how would you like to proceed and what investigations or management would you like to take this on? But, but, Ma'am, first we'll do a corneal scraping and then we'll send the samples for uh, back uh, gram staining, KOX smear, and also we have to send for cultures also. Uh, okay. Culture in the blood agar, uh, sabrod dextrose agar, then chocolate agar. So yes, you would do a corneal scraping for this patient here and you would send your smear specimen. One is for doing, uh, you, you would send your corneal scraping specimen, one for a smear. So you will make your slides. Whenever you say uh, answer in your exams, your slides are for gram staining, which okay. would help you to look at the cellular pattern of inflammation and particular organisms which you are looking for. And two, you would make a potassium, a KOH stain, a potassium hydroxide, wet mount stain to look for fungal hyphae. So these will be on your corneal smear examinations and you would send your scraping material to uh, for, for cultures as well. So a direct plating is what is desirable if that is available in your center here. So direct plating will be on your blood agar plates to detect your bacterial growth. And if you're suspecting other fastidial organisms or non-aerobic organisms, you would choose your plates of agar accordingly here. And then the next plate, as you rightly said, is for fungal growth and it's usually an SDA plate, which you would like to plate on. And in centers where you do not have a direct plating facility, you have what is known as a, a transport medium, which is, is available as a glucose broth. So you can put it onto a glucose broth and it's taken onto a laboratory where the plating is done, though this is not a a desirable but in several centers where uh, which lack the facility of direct plating then this is something which which can be done so this is how you would proceed in your investigation of this particular uh, of ulcer and you know it is a fungal ulcer here and several times your wet koh mount will be able to pick out your uh, mm -hmm. septate or aseptate hyphae depending upon the type of organisms which you're seeing so do go back and look at your your slides. So given the lack of time, we are not going to do that. So go back and look at your, your microbiology slides to look at the various appearances of how aspergillus is going to look at. Most of the time, fusarium, everything what you would find is a hyphae on your on slides and the density would depend upon the, uh, the amount you are able to harvest and put onto your slides here. And that would be a clinching diagnosis and helps you to start an empirical or helps you to start a definitive antifungal therapy here. And when you're giving antifungals, you probably would not want to give a, a, a antibacterial or a very low dose antibacterial if you're very sure it does not have a bacterial secondary infection. Or if you want to give a broad covered bacterial, then you could probably add on a QID or a 4 hourly drops. 
Again, most of your antifungal agents, as Anil rightly pointed out, have poor penetration. So what you what you have is a diagnostic scraping. So when you scrape, you're creating an epithelial defect. And when you have an epithelial defect, the penetration and the bioavailability of the antifungal to the, uh, to, to the deeper tissues is better and your, your healing rates would be much better. Yeah. So that's one uh, particular thing. And what we have is natamycin. We have amphotericin B, which has to be formulated. We have oriconazole. Hydroconazole is an additive. We usually do not use it separately here because our other azoles are acting better here. But something which is new and coming into the anvil is the role of antifungal sensitivity testing here. And uh, now we do find a lot of resistance to both natamycin, amphotericin, and voriconazole. And this probably is also a particular reason why some of our fungal organisms do not respond well and also newer emerging organisms. So something in your exams you might be asked is what are the newer organisms? So do read about your, your pythium characteristics here. Anil, would you like to chip in on that? Uh, <laughs> uh, not really, ma'am. We don't see much of pythium uh, keratitis here. Yeah, so I, I also do agree. I, I guess either we are missing it because it's not as easy to, you know, have a microbiological uh, 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 my slide to look at it and put it on as pythium. So I also agree with you that probably I have not seen as many pythium as which is being discussed in our other platforms out here. Yeah. So your antifungal therapy and you would look at the, on follow-up, you look at the resolution of the epithelial ulceration, the stromal keratitis, the resolution of the hypopion. And if on medical management, your, uh, your healing pattern is not satisfactory, and if you have a, a chronic ulcer, meaning an ulcer being present on the ocular surface for over three to four weeks, then you have a, with, with the associated corneal thinning, you would consider a, a surgical intervention of a therapeutic keratoplasty. Anterior segment OCT imaging is another newer modality, which is now has a role to play in the management of fungal corneal ulcers here, but helps you to monitor the corneal thinning. And when your thinning goes beyond 50% of the stromal thickness is when it's going to alert your treating physician for being ready for a therapeutic keratoplasty. I think anything, Anil, you would like to add on before we wind up? Yeah, I, th I think uh, that's fine, ma'am. We had a fair uh, yeah, uh, than 10 minute the discussion. The aim of this is to trigger all of you to, you know, what you should be looking at and what you should be preparing to study here. So here we have looked at the, the signs, the symptoms, the clinical presentation features, clinical features, uh, the different type of fungal organisms which can cause uh, corneal ulcerations here. What is the difference in presentation between the uh, between fusarium and aspergillus? the corneal scraping, the media which are involved, then the antifungal agents which are available, their classifications, and uh, what are their mode of uh, action here, the dosages of these, uh, of these. Newer antifungals is something where some of your examiners might ask you about, and uh, newer emerging antifungal, uh, which mimic, uh, which are into the pain, is pythium infection. So I think this much would broadly cover and uh, most of them, they would not take you into therapeutic keratoplasty in your questioning. And I'm sure Dr. Anil has already taught you that uh, in detail as well. Can we move on to the next? Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, who's taking it on? A clinical description of this? Maybe one of your PGs can take it, ma'am. Any of our PGs? Can I see Rahul is there? Why, Bob? Um, Anyone? Uh, yes, yeah. Can you please on your video? Because otherwise it will be a ghost speaking on the YouTube. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or it's now, uh, am I audible, sir? Hello? Yeah, you're audible. Yeah, very yes. Uh, so, uh, man, this is a clinic. Uh, um, uh, this is a clinical picture of the eye, which is showing um, there is a diffused congestion on the uh, congestion, along with there is a whitish lesion, which is mostly a, a scleral melt, which is uh, around five mm, uh, around um, five into uh, three mm, and also there is a, some. Um, 
corneal um, thinning along with there is a hazing of the cornea is present ma'am this is mostly secondary to either my differential diagnosis mostly secondary to a tergium surgery or uh, otherwise a um, uh, some uh, peripheral uh, puk ma'am my okay so i think i i agree with you well done rahul here so as you can rightly see it's a highly inflamed eye which is present here it's a scleral melt here and uh, it's in the nasal region of the uh, nasal palpebral region and the adjoining sclera is also looking uh, is also looking inflamed it's probably thinned but what you can see is uh, based on this infection the, the surrounding cornea is relatively clear and it's not edematous here so this is a patient who had undergone uh, pterygium surgery elsewhere and presented to us um, uh, a few months following pterygium surgery with this kind of a melt on the ocular surface here so post pterygium uh, corneoscleral melts uh, can occur due to what reason what are the predisposing causes any anybody any postgraduate would like to take this on because of autoimmunity or hypersensitivity or because of using mycomycin c during the surgery okay so um, what were the first two ones you mentioned autoimmunity hypersensitivity um, okay hypersensitivity so i think the top reason would be your third point which you said is mitomycin c is the use of uh, mitomycin c so so more than mitomycin c again if your novice surgeons tend to go in for a deeper lamellar dissections here than which is necessary here so deeper lamellar dissections excessive use of pottery so that's another reason in pterygium surgery where if your novice surgeon start then they tend to you overuse their pottery here and the three is uh, uh, in an inappropriate use of mitomycin c here and again the use of mitomycin c on uh, dry ocular surfaces use of mitomycin c if there's been a missed autoimmune disease of the on of the ocular surface then these would definitely predispose to a, a melt which you are looking at this so you can see a very large uh, region of uh, joining the limbus you could see about 3 to 4 clock clock hours of scleral uh, melt here an ischemic sclera in this region the adjoining cornea probably seems to be thinned out here and they don't have a slit to make out over here there could be a Uh, a probable secondary infection as well, where you can see a few satellite lesions which are sitting at the periphery. What would you like to do for this patient? You can medically treat with oral steroids. Uh, oral steroids, okay. So, would you, if you were sitting in the casualty and you have a patient reporting to you like this, uh, would you like to just give in oral steroids on the first go? anybody anybody else would like to take this on so i think first when we yes viber um first of all we would uh, like to send the culture uh, uh, we would like to send the sample of the infected lesion as the etiology could be infected could be autoimmunity or then the use of mitomycin so yeah. to rule out the infectious uh, etiology we would send the uh, sample uh, for culture and staining followed by we can also add on uh we can also send uh, the test for autoimmunity testing like hla or esr to rule out any autoimmune uh, etiology and uh, also we can uh, consider starting any immunosuppressant agent along with our regular medication okay so here the first thing as you rightly said is you would rule out a surface infection here so this could also be an infective melt which started in the region of the the cornea where the pterygium excision was done and has spread on to the the uh, to the graft as well two it could also be a region where the 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 the, the pterygium graft has has been lost if they did attach it using a uh, using glue or if this fixation of the graft was not there the graft could have been lost as well here so you have to rule out a secondary infection so as rightly said you will have to do a uh, do your smears and cultures to rule out a secondary infection here and you would like to start a broad spectrum antibiotic in these patients here avoid using anti inflammatory medications 
So again, overuse of topical anti-inflammatories like nepofenac, bromfenac, NSAIDs, and overuse of topical steroids can also worsen a melt in a scenario when a mitomycin has been used. So you would like to withdraw your topical steroids for these patients here and uh, plenty of lubricants here. And if you have an ASOCT, you can look at the amount of corneal thinning here. Visual acuity needs to be documented and to see and also look at the, the astigmatism which has been caused by this pleurocorneal melt here. And uh, a copious amount of lubricants and wait and watch if this uh, is particularly healing. So you can see a surrounding granulation tissue, conjunctival granulation tissue, which could then grow up and cover this ischemic scleral melt here. And sometimes that itself will suffice. And if the epithelialization over the cornea starts occurring, you can probably just do away with just medical management. But if the scleral thinning is, uh, is impending, is leading on to an impending perforation here, and if the granulation tissue, the healing is not adequate to cover this, uh, this scleral and corneoscleral thinning, you can plan a lamellar a scleral, scleral patch graft or a corneoscleral patch graft, or you could just use even lamellar corneal tissue to cover this entire region here. So that will stabilize and you can uh, bring out, you can take a conjunctival graft from the adjoining suprotemporal region and cover that part over the sclera as well. And uh, just topical, uh, uh, once you've done a surgery, then you could use, uh, use topical steroids to control the inflammation along with broad spectrum antibiotic cover. So this is how you would like to proceed for your uh, uh, on management of this case. The take home message in this particular point is because most of you residents will be handling pterygium surgery. The correct technique of doing a superficial keratectomy, you just need to avulse the head of the pterygium from the underlying uh, cornea. You do not need to do a a deeper superficial keratectomy, which I do see a lot of some of the beginning or the learning surgeons trying to uh, cut out a lot of corneal tissue. So when you do cut out a lot of corneal tissue, that will lead to a lot of thinning, especially in a scenario of using uh, very frequent topical, um, potent topical steroids here. So that's something you will have to be cautious when you're using this, um, when you're doing pterygium surgeries here. Be careful when you're doing glue fixation that you do not lose your graft subsequently here. And uh, I do not personally advise using mitomycin for primary pterygium surgeries. But if, you're, if, you're, if you are to use it, use the correct, uh, sometimes it is always formulated by your assisting scrub nurse here. So be careful that the percentage which you use for mitomycin is uh, adequate here. And be careful that you're washing out the remaining amount of mitomycin. And when you've used mitomycin, do not overuse uh, NSAIDs and topical steroids, which can predispose to a melt. And be sure to identify those patients where a melt can be predisposed. Yeah. Anything, Anil, you would like to add on, Dr. Anil? Yeah, yeah. So if you are uh, encountering uh, such a case, I think uh, it, as Ma was telling you, it's very important to do the scraping. And uh, we should not blindly start uh, really systemic steroids. If there is a fungal infection, uh, that can be the end of the eye, actually. You, can, you may have to nucleate the eye. So we have to take the scraping. Actually, scraping can give you a clue on uh, what is the organism also. Like if you see that there is a lot of neutrophils, it uh, gives an indication that there is a bacterial infection going on. And uh, sterile melts usually won't have that. So, but you have to always keep this whenever you have an yellow color. Uh, we uh, we tend to think that it's an infection, it, but it can be a sterile melt also. So both the possibilities you have to you have to consider. I think it's wiser to start uh, doxycycline because for both it might help. It will prevent the collagenolysis. So doxycycline, I think uh, we we would have seen um, all of us use it in PUK and scleritis. Uh, so you can use that. And uh, give uh, copious lubricants. If you can uh, do a punctal plug, that would be better. Uh, obviously, you have to rule out infection. If there is a sign of infection and uh, the scrapings reveal infection, you have to treat it accordingly. And uh, take it, uh, we have to give it some time. And if it's not responding only, we have to do pass graft and other surgical management, as Ma'am rightly uh, pointed out. 
So, like, uh, it's important to reduce the amount of surgical trauma that you cause, especially scleral dissection. And uh, quite often, we want to make the cornea very clean. And uh, we tend to uh, scrape and scrape and do a lamellar keratoplasty also there, lamellar keratectomy also there, which uh, at best is avoided. I think anything the residents want to ask, the postgraduates, anything, anybody? Otherwise, we can go on to the next one. Case three, who's presenting? Um, uh, I would like to ask, uh, ma'am. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so if it is uh, infective, like uh, tuberculosis, which are the infections which can actually come into the sclera? Like in a tertium surgery, yes, there could be a lot of in infections. Otherwise, de novo, what are the infections which can occur in the sclera, which, can, which is actually resistant to infections significantly? I think tuberculosis can have or... What are the other infections which can? You're, you're asking for infectious scleritis. Scleritis, yeah. So I mean, infectious scleritis, scleritis can also present this way, right? Yes. The, I think the, uh, uh, the pathogenic organisms which can cause infectious scleritis are just as wide as those which can cause infectious keratitis. Okay. And commonly in infectious scleritis, they do have a preceding history of uh, injury here. Or once if they do not have injury, if it's systemic infections, commonly is mycobacterium tuberculosis or atypical mycobacteria. Nocardial infections can cause. You can have staph strepto as well. And all these can cause, you know, scleral tubercles within here. Or usually it's the overlying conjunctiva and the sclera, which is quite inflamed. And they could be either a diffuse inflammation or a nodular scleritis here. And several times we tend to mistreat these as just uh, as idiopathic scleritis patients here. But uh, when you have a non-resolving scleritis coming to you over a long period of time with an associated history of systemic infections such as tuberculosis, it's wise to do a, a biopsy in these patients to find out what is going to be your infective organism. Okay, so in the first time you will not do a biopsy you will only do a screening really you will not unless you're 100 percent sure it's an infectious scleritis yeah so Most then only you will consider a biopsy later only we'll consider biopsy so the scleritis which you look at is we will be treating them with anti-inflammatory agents here and you would see that their response here so infectious scleritis you would be on your first go if you're seeing patients who have had history of trauma if you're looking at patients who have undergone surgeries like a a glaucoma implants, those who are having RD implants here, you have an encyclage, you have a buccal infections. So these will be having associated scleral infections here. And that's when your, your top differentials of an infectious scleritis is going to come into play here. Another extension of infection into the sclera is when you're having peripheral ulcerative keratitis here. So usually there you have the PUK picture is totally different here. And uh, you, it could be associated with lid infections as well here. And there could be atypical microorganisms which can cause these infections. And they tend to be slow, indolent infections here. The other differentials being here would be a, a Murens ulcer here. But you would see in Murens, it's largely restricted to the, uh, the cornea here. And the surrounding or the adjoining sclera is usually not as inflamed here. Autoimmune diseases can lead to a similar picture as well. Anything, Dr. Anil, you would like to add on? Uh, yeah. Uh, among the bacteria, I think Pseudomonas is notoriously common and it is yes. quite often devastating to the eye. Uh, so you have to treat it very aggressively with necrotic debridement and uh, intense topical therapy along with systemic uh, therapy. And a lot of these patients are uh, having systemic issues like especially diabetes and you have to control it adequately and treat it. And sclera being in a vascular tissue, the, the, the organism tends to reside in it for a long period of time. And just like osteomyelitis, you have to give for long periods. You have to give systemic uh, antibiotics or antifungals for long periods. So I think it's uh, slightly difficult for a patient to take, but uh, you have to, uh, quite often we have to admit and uh, give uh, any of this antifungal or antibiotic medications for a long period of time. And we go to the next case. We are running a little short of time, right? Maybe who is the next? Uh, Gargi, can you take this on?
so this is a clinical picture in which we can see congestion uh, in the conjunctiva and superficial uh, uh, superiorly uh, uh, white infiltrate uh, my clinical diagnosis might be uh, sterocolonotonin infection or uh, bacterial uh, keratitis or superficial marginal keratitis Yes, uh, I, I think you rightly pointed out here that you are finding a, it's a pseudophagic eye possibly here. Yeah? So when you describe it, it's a pseudophagic eye. It's a clinical photograph showing a, a pseudophagia with superior infection. You, it looks like infiltrate. It's, it's I think, a more of a fundus photograph uh, machine, which has been used to do a clinical picture or a or uh, or one of your phone cameras which has taken the picture so it looks like there's a superficial infiltrate in the superior cornea you can find uh, superficial vascularization which is growing in going in as well and if you do have a history of a recent cataract surgery in such patients and, uh, and it's, since it looks like a, a large region of superior infiltration you would put your differentials as a as a scleral tunnel so this picture was shared to me by uh, uh, Dr. Anita, who does cornea at uh, Aravind uh, Thirunelveli here. And uh, it, this was a, a, a nocardia tunnel infection, which you're having. So this patient had a history of cataract surgery. A small incision uh, cataract surgery had been done. And about uh, six to eight weeks following the cataract surgery, the patient came back with an indolent infection involving the scleral tunnel, the corneoscleral tunnel region here. Since the rest of the cornea finds a slow indolent infection, most of the times it tends to get uh, missed unless the, the infection has spread into the adjoining sclera as well or unless the treating surgeon has uh, lifted and looked at the, uh, the wound region. So one of the important take-home messages is when you're seeing your cataract patients, don't just be happy when seeing the central and the paracentral cornea. Always take a minute to lift up the lids and examine the wound region, especially if you've done superior incisions here. Most of us have this, uh, moved on to do temporal cleocorneal incisions when we are doing phacos, but, um, uh, but several surgeons doing SICS still prefer to do a superior uh, sclerocorneal tunnel so they, as it's covered by the lid. So do remember to lift up and look at your sclerocorneal tunnel region here. And uh, nocardial infections, atypical mycobacteria, you could have simple staphylococcal, streptococcal infections as well. And uh, you could have pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is more, uh, more of a very uh, fulminating, rapidly progressing. It won't look as indolent as you're seeing in this. Looking at the indolent picture, you can think it's probably a nocardia. You could give a differentials of a fungal keratia, of a fungal tunnel infection here. So the take home message is to go back and look up your literature on uh, tunnel infections following cataract surgery. What are the percentage of, uh, of uh, tunnel infections? What are the uh, other infective modalities which can occur following infections like uh, endophthalmitis, then management modalities for endophthalmitis. Uh, another common differential here is uh, uh, a peripheral blepharokeratoconjunctivitis. So if you do see uh, an inflamed lid margin, a lot of mebomitis, a lot of secretions on the surface here, then you could also give in a differential of Mebomian gland dysfunction with a blepharokeratoconjunctivitis. These would uh, broadly cover the, uh, uh, the clinical conditions which you would like to think of when you're managing or when you're looking at such a spot. Dr. Anil? Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, wound infection is a very, uh, it's a disastrous uh, condition as far as uh, a cataract surgery patient is concerned. Uh, even if it's a bacterial infection, the response to antibiotics is not very good quite often. So we may have to resort to patch graft and uh, patch graft means you remove only that part of the wound, uh, that part of the cornea and put a new cornea there. So that's actually fungal, uh, uh, the corneal infections, wound infections are pretty common. And as I was mentioning, mycobacterial and uh, nocardia infections are also common. I think it was a common some time ago when people used to reuse the blades, you know, uh, and they used to uh, clean it with uh, this glutaric, this other uh, glutaric hydride and other stuff like that. So these mycobacteria being um, resistant organisms, they used to stick onto this and 
cause infection. But nowadays, people uh, have moved away from it, and so such uh, infections are rare. But nocardia infections and fungal uh, wound infections we do see, and it's uh, very difficult to manage. Quite often, uh, this uh, topical agents do not work, and we may have to resort to this uh, patch grafts quite, uh, quite uh, very commonly. Yes, as Dr. Anil rightly pointed out, uh, medical management is usually difficult. So how we would proceed is you would want to do a scraping to, to detect the organism which is causing. And once you have an organism which is getting, and some of them do resort to early uh, intrastromal injections around your, the region of the tunnel, because usually you might not have an overlying epithelial defect and it is a, a stromal infiltrate sitting here. So your topical agents do not penetrate as Dr. Anil rightly pointed out. And some do resort to intrastromal injections here if you are, they are fungal infections or if they are early bacterial infections. But that said and done, the waiting time for, uh, for, for these is much lesser. Your threshold for waiting is much less here because they tend to progress deeper. And you probably want to do a, a patch graft for these patients earlier on so that you are able to debulk and control the, the infection early on and prevent more severe morbidity in these conditions. I think let's move on to the next one. So we are already on 740. Mira. Anybody would like to take this? Any of our PGs here? Any of my PGs? I think we did have it in a, one of the quiz programs which we had conducted a while ago. I think this is a difficult, uh, uh, difficult question. So I'm, I'll, I think I'll take it on and explain it to you. This is one of the newer things. So you do have your uh, Netasudil, which is now come into, uh, come into vogue, and the many people are doing, are using Netasudil medication here. Uh, for yes, Tapashri. Ma'am, netarsudil associated epitheliopathy. Hmm, yeah, so this is. Honeycombing uh, pattern. Yes, this is called a reticular epithelial edema here. So normally your epithelial edema is microcystic. So this is a macrocystic epithelial edema which you're seeing here. So the slit is slightly showing you this is a epithelial in nature and you have a sort of a reticular pattern. And sometimes you might put in a differentials of this uh, of an anterior anterior um, corneal dystrophy here. But if you have a history of a patient using some medications, and uh, you can go back and ask what these patients have been using. This picture is very pathognomic and characteristic when patients are using metarsudil eye drops, especially in a scenario of raised pressures and when there is stromal corneal edema here. So when you use metarsudil. The exact mechanism of action which causes this kind of macrocystic edema is not yet clear here. And the treatment for this scenario is withdrawal withdraw, or stopping netasudil. The macrocystic edema resolves and you will have to look at other modalities of controlling the intraocular pressure here. So this is a very pathognomic picture and this is one of the, uh, one of the side effects which has come with the newer medications which we are now using for um, anti-glaucoma control here. So this I think was usually one of the questions in any of your MCQs or uh, if you are uh, looking at um, newer advancements and uh, I think we won't spend much time on this and we'll move on to the next one. I'm bad. Yeah, can I? Yes, sir. Anil, you want to add on yeah, something? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any other anti-glaucoma medication which can cause uh, a corneal edema? Mm -hmm. Not exactly this pattern, but... Uh... Yes. Anybody? I think in the interest of time, I will answer. Okay. It's uh, dorsolamide can cause uh, actually... Uh, something which looks like Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. You know, it will cause endothelial dysfunction, which is transient. But the important thing is that it's an idiosyncratic reaction. It's not dose dependent. So it only it happens in some people. Uh, so this corneal edema, especially microcystic edema and some stromal edema can occur. So the thing is, again, you stop dorsolamide and see whether it improves or not. 
have seen a few patients like that. Yes, I agree, Dr. Anil, and that's one reason why I think as corneal surgeons, we usually do not like to give uh, AC inhibitors for our uh, management of glaucoma in the immediate post-operative phase till our grafts become viable, the endothelium takes on and uh, goes on into the, into the near normal physiological mode of action. Can we move on to the next one? Yes, yeah, sure. Anyone would like to describe this? This can be a very common uh, long case which can be put up for you in your uh, exams. Ira, can you use it? Look at it. Uh, this is a clinical photograph. Corner okay. showing uh, signs post, probably post keratoplasty, for so, show signs of uh, vascularization and the mild stromal edema, probably because of graft rejection. Okay. Uh, yes, um, this is a clinical photograph of, uh, I think it's probably the right eye of the patient here. And uh, what you can see is a, a vascularized graft, which is there. It's already, it's looking like a failing graft here. So it roughly seems to be about, say about uh, 7, 7.5 millimeters in diameter with the significant uh, vascularization, both superficial and deep here. And you're having a differential corneal edema. There is a a superficial haze in the cornea involving largely the, the central and the paracentral and the infrotemporal regions and the differential corneal edema. What you're seeing here in the slit is the superior part of the slit is thinner than the middle and the inferior parts here, which is edematous, which is showing that um, this patient is probably undergoing a, a rejection reaction. So this is a, a, a vascularized bed here. So we know that the patient is got um, immunosensitized to the uh, the to the um, um, to the um, donor antigen here and has developed a, a graft rejection reaction here. So, ma'am, uh, just because there is a differential edema of the cornea, inferior part showing more edema than the superior part, can we say that it is rejection, or is it better to say it's a failing graft? Rejection is one of the causes of a failing graft here. No, but can we say it is rejection here? Yeah, you on... can say it's a, this, this is probably not one of the full-blown pictures. This is probably a picture when the patient is following up to us. And several times the patient do not present to us immediately soon after where you can see a corridor line or where you can see KPs here. So you probably would see if you look up closer, you can see this part, you can see a thin line over here here. And uh, so this is more visible and you do a good slit lamp examination. So this is probably the line which is differentiating the, the region of the graph. So here you're having a deep vessel over here. Here you're having vessels here. Here you're having deep vessels here. So the immune attack is now for, is there mounted on this part of the graph here. So this is largely clear still here. So it's a very pathognomic picture of a of a high-risk recipient bed, a vascularized graft here and a, a rejection reaction has been mounted on. And you can see that the eye is not looking as inflamed. So probably this patient is already on, on topical immunosuppressant therapy with one hourly or two hourly steroids and has also been given an IV pulse steroid picture. So this was one of the pictures of a patient who's already on treatment for a graft rejection here. So if this comes to you for a long case, then you would elicit the history of this patient here. You would elicit for how long the patient had useful vision here. And you would look at all the inciting factors which would have caused rejection and describe a high risk recipient bed here. So those will be your questions on what are the, what are the predisposing factors for causing immune rejection in such a patient here. And if you have to do surgery for such patients, what would you like to do? Suppose this was your long case. So if you're having a failing graft here, probable due to an immune rejection, it would be my diagnosis here. So how would you proceed on this? So if your examiner asks you, what would you like to do for this patient? How would you, what would you say? Anybody? So I think in the interest of time, if you're having a patient who's having an acute rejection here, then you would manage the 
uh, graft rejection here. So the, it's frequent one hourly topical steroids for this patient. And you would give in an IV pulse steroid for this patient here. And um, uh, IV pulse steroids, you would, you would use dexamethasone, 100 milligrams or methyl prednisone, 500 milligrams is what needs to be given for these patients here. After working up their, their, their systemic uh, investigations clears them for, a, uh, for a, a bolus or an IV pulse steroid therapy here. And one hourly steroids needs to be given here. Again, what is important is the duration for which they've had graft rejection. If patient presents to us within 10 days of uh, onset of graft rejection, the reversal is usually better, which means you're able to give them or immunosuppress them with systemic therapy before the total mounting of immunosuppressive, uh, uh, total mounting of the surface with your immune uh, cells here. But if the patient presents to you beyond two to uh, 10 days to two weeks, then um, your response to treatment is not going to be so good. So you might only get a partial reversal of the rejection or you might be not be able to reverse it at all. And this will lead on to a failing graft in such patients here. So once the graft is failing and you know that your therapy is not effective in these patients, you would probably want to just take these patients on for a repeat keratoplasty. So the question comes, when would you like to do a repeat keratoplasty in these patients? Normally, we would like to have a three to six months. Six months would be my cutoff of a, a period which is free of immune inflammations here. So that's the next question here. What is the type of keratoplasty you would like to do in these patients? And if your anterior corneal layers are clear, then you would like to do a uh, an endothelial keratoplasty for these patients. If you have a lot of anterior um, scarring, then a full thickness keratoplasty. Patients who have had repeated immune rejections are ideal candidates where you probably will need to do uh, keratoprocesses for them here. And some of them do resort to do primary keratoprocesses. Though in the Indian scenario, we would take up patients for multiple grafts along with systemic immunosuppressant therapy. So that is how keratoplasty on an immune, um, on a high risk recipient bed is different than from keratoplasty on a normal risk bed where the surface is not vascularized. And these patients will have to be worked up for suitability for immune suppressant therapy when you take them up for the next keratoplasty. So these are the common questions which would be asked if you have a, a failed graft or a failing graft in your spotters or long cases or short. Anything Dr. Anil wants to add on? Is there any role of VEGF in um, vascularization of the cornea? Uh, see, as you know, VEGF is going to act on new vessels. So here you are, uh, some people do cauterize the vessels and then give VEGF onto it. But the fact is, what we are doing is these are all full formed vessels already. And even if you cauterize, you know that they're going to be opening up or recanalizing after a point of time. So I'm not a strong proponent of using uh, anti-VEGF therapy for these because I do not believe it stops. Anti-VEGF only helps in stopping new vessels forming. These vessels are already full-blown vessels. And these vessels have bought in the access of immune cells into the cornea, which was immune privileged earlier. So it's just a channel by which and the cells have already loaded the surface. So it's really not going to help. What helps is immunosuppressing them when you take them on for a subsequent keratoplasty. Shall we move on to the next? Or is Dr. Anil there to add on? To yeah, something? yeah. I think, Hi, Dr. Anil, yes. Yeah, yeah. And I think this uh, wedge of expression is uh, like HSV keratitis and all, no? Uh, that it gets too much altered and then we, that's probably the genesis for uh, uh, the corneal neovascularization in especially HSP keratitis. Uh, we don't know exactly what are the exact uh, mechanisms uh, underlying that. But uh, generally speaking, anti vegf does not work very well in corneal neovascularization. Mm -hmm. okay. The next one, please, then. Can we move on, Dr. Yeah, Anil? Yeah, please. Yeah, sure. Anybody else wants to try this? Any of my PGs? If they're still there? Uh, Ma'am, uh, this is clinical picture. Is showing there is a... Um, oh, yeah. Yes, Rahul. 
yeah ma'am and this is a clinical picture which is showing that there is a uh, inferiorly there is reduced stromal edema is present and also superiorly there is a thinning of the cornea is also present mostly a, an acute hydro secondary to an ectatic disease ma'am hmm. okay so that was an easy one yes so you could see a uh, a, a it's an acute corneal hydrops involving the inferior part of the cornea here so since the uh, the slit shows since you're having edema the slit does show a an edematous region in the cornea here and uh, if you closely look and uh, since i know about the patient this patient is a case of corneal ectasia that he's not a keratoconus he's a pellucid marginal corneal degeneration here so if you do if you did uh, get an opportunity to examine you would know that the peripheral cornea here is is particularly thin here and you can have hydrops even in pellucid marginal corneal degenerations here but commonly yes you would see hydrops in keratoconus patients why does hydrops occur mahul ma'am secondly to the breach in the dismens membrane uh yes so the cornea starts in progressive corneal ectasias as the anti uh, as the uh, cornea is bulging forward and there is thinning of the stroma the desmets get stretched and then it ruptures here allowing aqueous fluid to seep into the stromal tissue and cause corneal edema so what will be the clinical presentation for such patients the patient can be come with the decreasing of the vision ma'am along with the severe photophobia and uh, gradually progressive decreasing of the vision ma'am yes so commonly they they start becoming photophobic here and sometimes if it's not involving the central cornea they might not notice a diminution of vision or most of them already have compromised vision so they might not tell you that the vision has fall is has dropped here so only when you examine them you will find a, a region of uh, of haze here and if it's been present for a longer period of time the haze is significant the photophobia is present and it involves the the central cornea the amount of vision drop is quite significant here so that leads you on to the next question what is the medical management of corneal hydrops ma'am we can be used for the hypotonic saline as uh, for the use uh, for decreasing the edema ma'am okay so one is whenever you're looking at a compromised cornea when there is uh, edema present you would like to give a antibiotic for the corneal surface so that secondary corneal infection does not occur then you would use hypotonic saline here to to cause detergents or to decrease the corneal edema you can add on anti glaucoma agents either topical or oral as well for resolution and some amount of uh, of inflammation which can occur because of this edema is controlled by a uh, low potent steroids and uh, watch these patients closely here again the duration for which the uh, hydrops is present is important to see uh, important to see, uh, prognosticate how it's going to be resolving if patients present to us earlier on and uh, before a full blown edema is there the resolution could be better but if you find the medical management is not resolving then you would want to take on take the patients on for a uh, for a surgical or uh, interventional modality so what interventional modalities do you know of such patient um, we can be used to compressing sutures for these patients ma'am okay so what what is conventionally described is the use of intrastromal uh, intracameral air or gas injections here so gas you have sf6 or c3 f8 uh, combinations here and what you have to know is these are non expansile combinations of the gas here you would not want to give expansile combination so you would give non expansile or uh, or simple intracameral uh, air injections air does not stay on for a longer period of time so if you want to, you could give uh, uh, intra intracameral gases c3 f8 or sf6 which could stay on for up to 2 to 4 weeks here and that will help in tamponading the the ruptured desmets membrane and prevent further seepage and helps in the resolution of the edema so uh, the question is when would you like to intervene is if you are having a long standing edema here and you want a rapid resolution so you generally would tend to if the patient is coming to you earlier within 10 days then uh, you an early intervention helps in rapid resolution and early visual rehabilitation of these patients and once this heals there is an amount of flattening in the region where the desmets has ruptured and uh, this would uh, change your refraction and your contact lens fitting if you're taking these ectasias on for 
visual rehabilitation. So that's a particular um, thing which you will have to remember. Now, of late, what has been described is a, a combination of various modalities where you would be giving medical management, you would give intracameral air and use uh, compression sutures where the, the, des the ruptured desmets is opposed by intrastromal sutures and a bandage contact lens. So this modality of combination of several interventions is said to increase or cause rapid resolution of the corneal edema and favor early visual rehabilitation in these patients. So I think this has been described from India, from the LVP group here, where they have shown that uh, a combination modality helps in rapid resolution and also does away with the need to use intracameral gas, which can have, uh, uh, have uh, side effects or complications such as secondary glaucoma or a pupillary block glaucoma. So simple compression sutures, intracameral cameral, uh, air with vantage contact lens can work wonders and cause early resolution of these corneal high drops. Dr. Anil? Yeah, uh, I was uh, wondering how these clinical pictures can be misleading, ma'am. I thought it's a uh, <laughs> elastic flap. I was imagining elastic flap and yes, I thought it's yes, a very I, I, Yes, I, I did hear about that. I, I do, I'm sorry, I did not give you a more... Um, uh, a more easy picture to look at, yes. Yeah. Uh, so this was a, a PMCD patient, uh, which resol resolved with medical management. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So this, uh, that uh, as ma'am was telling that I have seen this, uh, some presentations of Dr. Sunita and all using a combination of intracameral layer and uh, compression switches. They seem to work well. But again, always there is, uh, whenever something new comes, there is something we try to cling on to that. And yeah. uh, some uh, 10, 15 years ago, it was intracameral uh, SF6 or C3F8. But now I think people are slightly moving away because of the complications associated with it, unless uh, indicated in young patients and uh, people who want to get back to work so fast. Yes, I agree, yes. I think we can move on to the next. Dr. Anil, I'll, I'll leave you to take the discussion for this. I think one of the first years can also take it. <laughs> Should we? Yeah, who are the actually? Yeah, Afreen. Um, this picture shows uh, a V-shaped protrusion of the lower eyelid. Uh, probably due to um, advanced keratoconus. Uh, it's, the sign is called Munson sign. Um, okay, fine. So do you see Munson sign in normal people? Is it possible? It's, it's indeed possible, especially people with astigmatism and all. Quite often we see normally Munson sign. So, but if uh, in a, uh, like if there is a patient with other features of keratoconus, Munson sign is something additive for the diagnosis. Okay. Yeah, what are the other clinical features of uh, keratoconus or central corneal ectasia? Mm -hmm. When you do a retinoscopy, what will you see? When you do a direct ophthalmoscopy, what will you see? Cesarin reflex, astigmatism, flasher ring, risuti sign, okay. uh, inferior stiffening. Sir, when we throw uh, light from the temporal side nasally, there will be the reflex, sir. A conical reflection will see, sir. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So first, then, uh, uh, you told that first there is uh, in the retinoscopy, you'll see the splitting uh, reflexes then? Astigmatism. Okay. So anything else which you will get from the refraction room? 
the endpoint is difficult to reach. You know, uh, the patient usually will not come to six by six, mm -hmm. and uh, there is a variation in the refraction. You know, one one moment it will be one particular cylindrical power, other moment it will be slightly different. And uh, if you see such a disparity, you have to think of uh, keratoconus definitely. Yeah. What else? In the slit lamp examination, one monsoon sign, the sooty sign, then pressure string. Pressure string. What is pressure string? It's uh, iron deposits on the. Okay. Where does it happen? Mm, what sir, does it the Epithelium usually inferiorly it will be seen, sir. No, it, it usually it's because of the uh, tear film accumulation. No, the change in the iron content in the tear film at the, it happens at the base of the cone. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, any other uh, street lamp findings that you know? I mean, this. Uh, Vogt's try. Vogt's try. Okay. Vogt's try. What are Vogt's try? Uh, vertical striations uh, seen in the stromal stromas. Those are posterior stromal folds seen. And how do you know it's Vogt's try? When we apply the pressure, it will disappear. Okay. When you apply pressure, it will disappear. So that is because of the uh, like pressure on the cornea and the cornea is ectactic. So there is some pressure, there is some posterior stromal fold happening. So if you apply a central pressure, it will disappear. If you rub your eyes like that, keratoconus will come also. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anything, any comment about the corneal nerves? Prominent corneal nerves. Prominent corneal nerves is a feature of keratoconus. Then uh, rarely you can see uh, faint anterior stromal scarring, just subepithelial scarring. Then at the, uh, at the tip of the cone, quite often you can see the corneal gutte also. So these are also described. Okay. So can you show the slide once more? I... Okay, so can you show the slide? Who's showing it? Sir, it's already visible. Yeah, okay, okay, fine. Sorry. Yeah. So, what difficulties will you encounter in patients' management? Dr. Gopal already asked you this question. <laughs> How would you proceed managing this patient? Anybody? Ma'am, ma the main difficulty is that ma we can't give the one particular refractive refraction. Like we can't but give the spectacles for a long time. It will go on changing. Okay. So you have to keep on change in glasses. So that's one of the yeah. earliest presenting symptoms yeah. for this patient here. Then, so you then usually see a myopic patient with frequent change in glasses. Okay. We have usually have a young adolescent or a young myope who is progressing myopia with frequent chain. Next. So we can go, then we can go next modalities. We can go with the contact lens. Okay. Other than that, when you're doing refraction, you will be able to pick up scissoring of the reflex here. Yes, okay. Scissoring of the reflex, meaning that the retinoscopy reflex, which you normally see, it gets split into two halves with each okay. half moving in different directions here. So it will not follow the routine pattern of a with or an against movement, which you would be able to see when you're doing refraction for either a myopic or a hyperopic patient here. So that since the, the reflex splits into two when moving into two separate regions, you opposing halves, it's called scissoring of the reflex. So you would find a patient who's probably a myope earlier. And when you refract these patients, you will find a scissoring of the reflex and you will not be able to refract these patients who were earlier refractable to 6-6. They will now subsequently, you will not be able to give them a 6-6 refraction and you'll probably only be able to do a 6-12 or 6-9. So this is one of the earliest difficulties you will encounter. And this is one of the earliest signs which will help you to pick up that this is a a patient who is uh, a cornea which is becoming keratoconic in these and the amount of astigmatism will also be higher and slowly the irregular astigmatism starts taking over and the irregular astigmatism starts the company starts becoming higher these will be the earlier uh, difficulties you will encounter when you are managing 
uh, such patients here. Okay, so will you see Munson sign in which type of keratoconus? Mild, moderate, severe. Mild will be in the severe category only. Uh, most of advanced keratectasias is when you will find your um, things. Mm -hmm. So what if why doesn't glasses help these patients? Mm -hmm. Because of the high component of high irregular component. astigmatism here. Okay. So irregular astigmatism is not amenable to spectacle corrections here. So you will have to resort to contact lens wear. So you will have to fit most of these patients with contact lens wear for, uh, for a better visual rehabilitation. I think in the interest of time, I'll just uh, sort of wrap it up for you that you will have to know the various signs of keratoconus and you'll have to know how to explain these signs and how to elicit these signs when you are examining the clinical features on slit lamp evaluation of these patients, investigations which you need to do for these patients. Before that, in clinical examination, you'll also have to know about the type of cones which are all present here, the classification of keratoconus, the earlier classifications of Amsler, uh, Amsler's uh, uh, Chromax classification, and the later ones which we now are based on topography, which is the ABCD classification given by Berlin here, and interpretation of pentacam and the pentacam pictures for keratoconus. Then uh, a little about uh, uh, the refraction parts, which I already told you, contact lens fitting in keratoconus, the special lenticular systems in keratoconus. Then uh, the, investigate the uh, interventional modalities in keratoconus, how would you diagnose progressive keratoconus? And uh, when would you resort to using uh, collagen cross-linking in those patients? Then a little about collagen cross-linking. The other interventional modalities other than contact lenses like use of intacts, fakie kiovals, and uh, surgical interventions in terms of uh, are you doing uh, lamellar grafts, uh, which is uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty in such patients or penetrating keratoplasties, the indications and how you will decide to use a, a lamellar or a full thickness keratoplasty. Newer interventional modalities include interstromal keratoplasties and using uh, uh, CARES or corneal allogenic interstromal ring segments. Those are the newer ones which you have in, uh, in uh, keratoconus. So this sort of completes your um, you know, questioning or uh, what you need to know on keratoconus because uh, this is one of the important long cases which you will definitely be seeing during your exams here. Dr. Anil, you would like to add on anything more if I've left out something? Yeah, nothing. I think we can move to the next case, yeah. case eight. Mira? Anybody, any of our, any of our residents want to take this? If this is a slightly difficult case, might be difficult for people who have not seen this very frequently. You can give the setting, ma'am. What is the setting of this case? This is a patient uh, who has come to us with the injury in the eye with fall of, uh, uh, fall of Alkali. a fall into the eye about four weeks ago. Ma'am, this is a clinical picture which is showing that diffuse congestion along with torrid neovascularization and the 360 degree there is table stems uh, deficiency is also there and also there is a central thinning of the cornea is also present mostly uh, like really an epithelial defect is also there ma'am and also diffuse to haze of the cornea is present. So this is a, a chronic chemical injury. So as I said, it's about four to six weeks. And as Rahul rightly pointed here, you can see slightly inflamed lead margins here. And the, the ocular surface is also inflamed. The conjunctiva is hyperemic here. And this region looks thin over here. And only if you stain, we will know if it is has epithelialized or if there is still a, an ulcer. There's probably a, a lack of, there's an epithelial ulcer which is sitting here. Yeah. This region is already thin. Epithelium has grown over over here. And here you can see a lot of conjunctivalization. So this is what we call, there is neovascularization. And there is also conjunctivalization, which means the conjunctiva is now crossing the limbus and has started to grow, in, or, or grow over the, the cornea. So all these are signs of, um, of partial limbal stem cell deficiency here. So this is a patient who has a chronic chemical injury sequelae 
and the patient is being treated with antibiotics, anti-inflammatory agents, uh, oral doxycycline here, vitamin C, sodium citrate, sodium ascorbate drops here. And uh, we are waiting for the surface to the surface epithelialization to occur. So this is a very classical picture of a chronic chemical injury uh, with surface uh, conjunctivalization, neovascularization and partial limbal stem cell deficiency, corneal haze, corneal thinning and a probable neurotrophic ulceration as well. And I mean, the presence of this much uh, neovascularization all across in the periphery, um, see, for, for, for diagnosing limbal stem cell deficiency and ischemia, generally there should be that white background around the limbus. We are not seeing it because of the that neovascularization. In an acute chemical injury. So when the patient is presenting to you soon after the chemical injury is when you will be able to look at the, uh, look at the limbal ischemia here. So this is already four to six weeks beyond. So the healing pattern has started occurring in these patients here. So if you're still finding the surface being neurotrophic and the epithelialization is not occurring and there is thinning here, these are the patients along with medical management, we would resort to an amniotic membrane transplantation to help in the surface healing. And uh, the stem cells definitely are damaged in these and subsequent management with other modalities will depend upon how the surface is healing. I think in the lack of time, we won't take up in greater detail. But as a spotter, they will just have to know that in a case of chemical injury, what are the surface signs they will have to elicit? What is the management of an acute chemical injury? How would you differentiate between an acid and an alkali injury in these patients here? What are the medical, uh, what are the topical medications which need to be given? What are the systemic medications to be needed, need to be given? What is the emergency maneuver they will have to do when they see a case of acute chemical injury when they are sitting in the casualty? So these are the important points which they will have to learn. And of course, a lot of theory on uh, the alkali injuries, the, um, the acidic injuries here can be read from any of the books. And uh, how, to, how to look at uh, limbal, in, in fact, if you just move to the next picture in the interest of time, that is one of the acute chemical injuries here. So here you can see a, uh, you know, a limbal ischemia staring at you. And this is in the first 10 days of injury here. Yeah. So this is one of our thesis patients for whom we were using uh, uh, platelet drops here, so which has rich in growth factors here. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the patient was, and as Gopal rightly asked here, you can see a, a large area of uh, severe uh, limbal ischemia which is present on. And as the patient is healing, you can start. You could see the corneal haze developing, the ulceration healing here, a lot of conjunctival congestion here, and here where the epithelial tissue was destroyed, you can see the epithelial granulation tissue, conjunctival granulation tissue, which is growing over and trying to cover over the, the ulcerated region. So as you see, when they go into the second week, this is the kind of picture you will start seeing. And depending upon the amount of inflammatory cells which have mounted onto the ocular surface, the surface damage will be the collagenolytic enzymes released on the surface. So those need to be tackled, the presence or absence of secondary inflammation. So best when you're seeing extensive injuries like this, you would probably along with medical management, take them all with amniotic membrane transplantations. Do go back and revise your, uh, uh, revise your um, literature on the classification of, uh, of chemical injuries. What is the latest classification, Duas classification, which is being used, the medical drugs which are used for management of uh, ocular surface chemical injuries and the surgical modalities in the management of these. I think this is what as postgraduates they would need to know. I guess we'll probably need to stop here, Gopal. Anything, Dr. Anil, you want to add on? Uh, yeah, I think when there is a severe limbal ischemia, yeah. that uh, denounce advancement, the graph can be done. Uh, like uh, if it's a very florid limbal ischemia, it can be done. Then uh, the newer thing that has come up is the the cadaveric slit, which is seen to be uh, very good, uh, like uh, not really, usually it was amniotic membrane uh, that was advocated if there is no epithelial cover. But uh, uh, people have seen that uh, if you have, we can put some cadaveric limbal stem cells also on top of the amniotic membrane, it gives a better healing response. Uh, I think the uh, the group from um, Shankarnetra, Lea Gita here and group has reported good, uh, good uh, results with that. 
then other things i think most of it ma'am has uh, covered and i think uh, <laughs> yeah if you want to discuss uh, alkali injury there is a lot to discuss i think it will take uh, easily more than uh, one or two hours so do we close here uh, gopal or do we take one last question yeah you can take one last question we can go up to 8:30 10 more minutes so the last uh, pentacam anybody any any resident would like to describe this pentacam we actually had a class on pent two classes in fact on yeah. corneal topography hmm yeah So anyone i don't want you to give me a diagnosis on this but just if you read a pentacam that's all this is usually kept in your black box or in along with your in your investigative maps so you can just read the map that's more than enough yeah and a few ready mira or netra yes ma'am yes And this is for my pentacam, which is showing. First, we have to look at the patient's details. After that, that's the quality scan. This actually, it's not good. Like um, we have to repeat in the data, okay. and also K one and K two. K two is actually fifty one point four diopter, ma'am. Here, and the K max is forty six point eight, ma'am. Then comes into the uh, thinnest pachymetry also, ma'am. We have to see the thinnest pachymetry uh, around. Um, We have to look at the thinnest pachymetry map here, and then comes into the axial uh, first um, curvature map. First, we can be seeing that there is a bow type um, astigmatism, and like astigmatic astigmatism, we can be seen on the first uh, map. Uh, then also we can uh, see in the uh, front elevation map. So we can see there is a increase in the rate. The value is around nineteen ton, and also there is a uh, ecstasy is also present map. And also the thinnest pachymetry we can be seen around four eighty three and four seventy eight. Um, around the three meet the three mm scan here. Uh, then the posterior elevation is also like as increased the mm like plus twenty six forty nine kias pass. Okay. Anything else? Anybody wants to add on? Okay, I think uh, Rahul has covered most of it. So first, I'm sorry I did not uh, cover the name of the patient here. This is a random map which I pulled up. Um, so what you what you have to read up is when you see you look at the age of the patient, you look at the eye which is being examined, and you could also it have the coding of OD here, the oculus dextrus, which means it's the right eye. You have four maps depicted here, so this is a quad map uh, of uh, Schemflux imaging done by the Pentacam. So that's also given out over here, and you can see K1 and K2. So K1 is the flat axis, and K2 is the steep axis here. So this K1 is depicted by blue color, and uh, K2 is the hot color, which is the red line, which is the steep axis. So what you are able to see here is uh, an oblique astigmatism here. With the steep axis round about uh, over here, which you could see, and uh, this is a, a bow tie pattern, oblique astigmatism, probably early skewing here because the flat axis is not in a straight line, and the steep axis is also starting to become a little more of irregular astigmatism. The elevation is is giving a very irregular pattern. Or oh, this is the elevation of the anterior cornea. This is the elevation of the posterior cornea, and you're having a a significant amount of raised elevations than you have over the normal ones so the red colors are called the hot colors and uh, and you have the uh, the the blue colors are called the warmer colors as you move on to the map which is the corneal thickness map you can find a region of the central cornea which is steep all the yellow ones is steep ones the green colors are where which are comparable to your best fit sphere and uh, the blue colors or the warm colors or the uh, 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 the blue colors the blue is the cool colors here which you are seeing out here so this is a map of uh, of a, of an astigmatic cornea a steep cornea as you can see because your k2 is already gone over 47.2 it's 51 point 
four diopters. There is central thinning, which you see your uh, central uh, thinnest pachymetry is about 473 in this cornea. So you're probably looking at an ectatic cornea in this particular patient here. Anything you want to add on, Dr. Rahul, for a postgraduate level of map reading? Ma'am, in this actually quality, we have to repeat the scan. Yes. So you can see a red which is seeing in the QS. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So the quality strength, which means the uh, the capture, the scan capture or the patient cooperation for the scan, the signal strength was not uh, uh, was not optimal and you would probably like to repeat uh, the scan until, uh, so that's one particular region where you also have to look at and see here that it's probably not a very reliable imaging on this particular patient here. Yeah. Dr. Anil, you would like to add on anything? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, it uh, looks like uh, like somewhat uh, symmetric bow tie, but I, yeah. I didn't see much of his hewing, ma'am. And uh, it's uh, a decentered uh, corneal apex. Uh, it yes. just gives me an impression like that. Mm. Maybe we need to look at the other, uh, the rest of the map, uh, bad and all that. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So this, I just put in this map so that they get oriented to the uh, particular aspects in readings so of what they have to look at and uh, what they have to interpret. It's not particularly to look at a diagnosis, but I think by now they will all know how a keratoconus map really looks like when they look at it. So this is just for uh, understanding what are the important aspects they need to look at. I think we shall close here in the interest of time. Gopal? Yeah, um, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, Meera, can you just stop sharing the presentation? Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. I would just like to uh, share, uh, you know, you can check out this particular book by Dr. Zia Chaudhary and Dr. Vanati, postgraduate ophthalmology. It's an excellent book. Uh, you can just look at this, check out this. Um, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much for this 90 minutes of uh, retina I and mean, cornea spotters. I think uh, for the postgraduates, I think it was really nice going through each case step by step, coming to the diagnosis, coming to the differential diagnosis findings, and then coming to a proper diagnosis and then the management. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gopal, for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Anil, as well, and all the postgraduates for joining in. Uh, uh, late this hour, especially those from our center. I think despite having board leaving exams tomorrow, I really appreciate you for having uh, 